Anarchy. Shipwreck. Disaster. Hello, my name's Jacob, and today on the History Chronicles we're going to be exploring an incident which led to 19 years of civil war in medieval England. This is the White Ship Disaster. Our story starts right at the beginning of the 12th century, when a new, young and ambitious king, Henry I, had taken over the throne of England. Henry had been crowned king on the 5th of August 1100 after an ambitious play for the throne. He secured the English treasury in a swift coronation only days after the sudden death of his brother, William Rufus. Rufus had been killed in a hunting accident in the New Forest, or perhaps even assassinated following a plot of his younger brother. Regardless of what happened here, this new energetic young king was to rule with considerable strength. Upon coming to power, Henry had immediately secured allegiance from many of his barons with a generous coronation charter. This guaranteed the freedoms of the church in England, something which William Rufus, Henry's older brother, had sought to exploit. Henry also moved quickly to secure his inheritance in Normandy, winning a decisive battle against the King of France and Henry's older brother, Robert Curthose in a place called Tonchbray in 1106. In his administration, Henry had moved wisely to appoint allies who depended on him for power. According to the chronicler Orderic Vitalis, these were men who were raised, so to speak, from the dust, taken from humble positions, trained up, and then given prestigious offices of state in Henry I's new regime. One such example was the Bishop Roger of Salisbury, Roger gained control of England's chancellery under Henry, and, as such, was able to develop it into a significant administrative force in England. Before Henry's reign, the collection of taxes had been possible, but had been conducted mostly on an ad hoc, piecemeal basis. Under Roger's careful eye and Henry's peaceful governance, the chancellery developed into an organisation that began to keep regular records of the income and expenditure of state. These records, which began to become known as pipe rolls, date from Henry's reign and started a legacy which lasted until 1833. So when did the problems for Henry start? For this we have to draw our attention further forward in Henry's reign to the year 1120. In this year Henry's son and only male heir, William, set sail on a voyage that was to have devastating consequences for the future of the English throne. Young William and his friends boarded a ship on the 25th of November that was to take them from Barfleur in France to the English coast. However, it was late in the year, the waters were choppy, and to make things worse, William and his men were evidently in a mood for celebration. One chronicler relates that they consumed wine in great abundance. Some even left the ship before it departed, seemingly prescient of its fate. With 300 people aboard, the ship foundered in the coastal waters of the English Channel. Its drunken passengers were ill-equipped to save themselves from death by drowning. Of the 300, only one survived, a lowly butcher from Rouen. This butcher took the news of the king's death to the king himself and told him that William, the heir to the throne, was dead. Henry appeared bereft at the loss of his son and spent the next years of his reign in a struggle to secure a new heir to the throne. Following the death of his first wife in 1118, he married the young Adeliza of Louvain in 1121. Unfortunately, though, this marriage was to be unfruitful in producing a male heir. Henry did have one other option, however. He had a daughter, Matilda, who at the age of eight had been married off to the Holy Roman Emperor in Germany. This marriage was an effort to broker an alliance for Henry on the continent. Matilda's husband, the Emperor Henry V, was 12 years older than his bride, and despite involving Matilda in the governance of his empire, this marriage too bore no children. Henry the Emperor died in 1125, leaving Matilda as his childless widow. In the harsh world of the Middle Ages, this often meant for a widow that the future was to go to a nunnery, or to have no significance in the political world whatsoever. But Matilda's father, Henry I, evidently wanted none of this. He now called her back to England, where she was to play an integral role in the future of the English state. Now that his son was dead, 
Henry was to see Matilda as the new and rightful heir to the English throne. At Christmas time at his court in 1126, Henry I got his barons to swear an oath that Matilda would be the next rightful heir to the Kingdom of England. At first the barons were reluctant to swear such an oath. After all, a female heir to the throne was unprecedented in English history at this time. After some dispute though, they eventually agreed and recognised Matilda's legitimacy. However, things were to take an increasingly complex turn with Matilda's second marriage. This was to a young prince on the continent, a man called Geoffrey of Anjou. Matilda and Geoffrey appeared to be mismatched. Matilda was 26 years old by this point, and Geoffrey had only just turned 14. What's more, Matilda still clung on to her title of Empress, something that she was to do for the rest of her life, and perhaps this shows that she was quite keen on retaining the status and privileges of her former life as the consort to the Holy Roman Emperor in Germany. But this new marriage was to her father's liking. Henry I aimed to secure for himself an ally on the continent in the Angevin family. This was important because the King of France, Louis VI, had recently taken over Flanders and an area called the Vexin. These were on the borders of Normandy and as such they put Henry's lands there at great risk. The royal wedding took place at Le Mans in 1128 with Matilda and Geoffrey tying the knot. Geoffrey reportedly made a big impact on the royal court of England, showing off his prowess as a young aspirational knight. Matilda, on the other hand, appeared unimpressed. She lasted only 15 months at Geoffrey's court before returning to England and going back to her father. It was Henry, though, who encouraged his daughter to return to Anjou, where, in 1133, the couple at last gave birth to a son. They named him Henry just like his grandfather. The problem now, however, was that Geoffrey was older and had become more confident in asserting his own power. In 1135, he asked his father-in-law, Henry I, for the rights to some of the castles in Normandy and also for the rights to have the Norman barons swear homage to him, to give him their respect, in other words. Castles were instrumental in the Middle Ages for attaining power and exerting influence over territory. They were very often not just military strongholds, but also hubs for commerce, trade and taxation. Henry refused Geoffrey's demand. In response, Geoffrey invaded Normandy in support of a rebellious baron there, a man called William of Ponthieu. Henry responded to Geoffrey's invasion with his own military campaign in Normandy. Henry was now in his 60s, but he was still quite able to launch a campaign across the English Channel and to attack the rebel positions throughout the autumn of 1135. It was not a military defeat that was to undo the king, however. It was instead a bit of a dodgy meal. Henry reportedly indulged in a surfeit of lampreys while staying at the Norman town of Lyon la Florette. Although it may not look too appetising from the picture, these eels were considered a delicacy in medieval France and were a favourite of the king. Nevertheless, this indulgence was to lead to Henry's demise. He became ill and summoned his court to him, appearing to acknowledge that he was near the end. Henry died on December the 1st, 1135, aged 67. He had been an energetic king from the start and had established a lengthy peace in England throughout 35 years of rule. The white ship disaster had unfortunately upended the guarantee of a peaceful succession once Henry had gone. By 1135, Henry's relationship with his daughter Matilda and his son-in-law Geoffrey had become fractious to the extent that he was campaigning against them. It is even possible that at this time, Henry released his barons from the oath that he had had them swear to his daughter. Indeed, it was one of these same barons, not Matilda, who was to become the next ruler of England. This man, Stephen of Blois, was to place himself on the throne of England at the popular consent of England's barons. On the 22nd of December 1135, Stephen was crowned in Westminster Abbey by the Archbishop of Canterbury. The succession crisis was far from over, however. Henry's legacy of stability was to be shattered by a succession crisis that was to ravage the kingdom for the next 19 years. Stephen and Henry's daughter Matilda now fought it out over the right to the English throne. According to one source, each man, seized by a strange passion for violence, was to rage cruelly against his neighbour. The white ship disaster of 1120 had unleashed a can of worms that were to become manifest in 19 years of civil war in England. Guaranteed inheritance was a vital component of medieval kingship. 
Having lost it in the tragedy of the white ship, England was about to enter the period of anarchy. I very much hope that you've enjoyed this episode of the History Chronicles, my first episode, and I hope that you can also like, subscribe and support the channel by clicking below. You can also join the Patreon page if you want to support the channel further, and I very much look forward to seeing you again on the next episode of the History Chronicles. Bye.